Welcome, foolish mortals, to Disney Coast to Coast. I'm here to introduce your host, your Disney Coast to Coast host. <laughs> Kindly raise your volume, please. Jeff has plenty of Disney chatter for everyone. There's no turning back now. <laughs> Hey folks, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, the ultimate unofficial Disney fan podcast. I'm Jeff DePauly, and today on the show, my friend and author Aaron Wallace returns to discuss a Halloween tradition of his that I just love. I call it the ultimate Halloween theme park Orlando attraction marathon, where Aaron and his friends hop around to Orlando theme parks to experience all that is Halloween and spooky. It sounds like a super fun tradition that I hope to take part in some year, but for now, I'll have to live vicariously through Aaron as we discuss. It's all coming your way right after this. Smell is such a big part of the Halloween experience. Whether it's smelling your favorite candies, hot cider, dead leaves, fog, and the myriad of other smells related to the fall season, they all give me cozy feelings. And now, souvenir scents can help fill your home with the smells of the season. I literally have their Halloween horror maze candle lit next to me as I record this message, and I'm getting some serious sense memories. Souvenir Sense is creating handmade candles to help bring your most cherished vacation memories into your home. Their unique scents are individually formulated to bring the most realistic representations to life. You won't find these variations anywhere else. And they have numerous options for the spooky season beyond the previously mentioned Halloween Horror Maze Candle. There's also Halloween Horror Fog, Ghostly Mansion, Halloween Horror Puppets and Dolls, Halloween Horror Pumpkin Lord, and E.T. Forest, which, yes, is a Halloween movie that we'll discuss later in this podcast episode. These Halloween favorites are in addition to Souvenir Scent's regular theme park scent offerings. So head on over to Souvenir Scent's by clicking the link in this episode's description and use code DCTC to save 10% off of your entire order. It's time to dive into today's Disney dialogue. Hello, Aaron. Welcome back. You are here to talk about Halloween, not Golden Girls. I'm sorry, but welcome back. Always a pleasure to have you. Uh, it's my other favorite thing. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Great to be back. <laughs> of course. Uh, you know, today we're talking about my favorite holiday. And you told me once about something that you and your friends do in the theme parks for Halloween that I was like, I love that you do this. This is super exciting. I call it the ultimate Halloween theme park attraction marathon, and you will find out why soon. But I want to know, I guess, give us a brief synopsis of what this is. And I want to know how this tradition began for you and your friends. Sure. Well, first of all, the name you just gave it is a way better name than we ever came up with for ourselves. But essentially what this is, is that sometime during the Halloween season, uh, very often on Halloween day, uh, my friends and I will do every what we call Halloween attraction in all the parks in Orlando on the same day. Uh, so that includes the four Walt Disney World theme parks, and very often we throw in the two Universal theme parks as well. So what do I mean by Halloween attraction? Any ride or show that either directly or explicitly or in some cases more tangentially or, or in an abstract way engages with the Halloween holiday. And uh, I've put together a whole list to share with you. But the way this started um, was really, as I recall it, on a whim. This would have been in like 2012. I was brand new to living in Orlando. I'm in my like mid-20s, right? And so you have to put yourself in that frame of mind, like young, wide-eyed youth, new to living behind Walt Disney World. And you still have that just like excitement of living in the magic. And you just want to be in the parks as often as possible. And, you know, free time was about just like, go, go, go to the parks. And so it was out of 
that sort of mentality that this idea of like, hey, wouldn't this be such a cool way to celebrate Halloween uh, really grew? And it turned out to be a lot of fun and something we have done at least most years since. Okay, very cool. And was it someone's initial idea or was it kind of a group effort? I have a feeling this was your initiation. I mean, honestly, it might have been, but here's what I mostly recall. And the details are fuzzy for me at this point, but I remember it being very much on a whim. Uh, it, it might have been even like the morning of, or maybe we were on our way to the parks and we just said, you know what would be crazy? What if we just did all the Halloween attractions? And then somebody said, should we go to Universal too? It's like, do you think we could do that in one day? Could we get to six parks in a day? Uh, and we did it. And it was just awesome. So how many years do you think you've you've done it like successfully and like really hit everything on this list of some of the stuff is retired at this point. But I don't know. How many times do you think you've actually accomplished this? And when is the last time you actually did it? Yeah, so quite a few. I mean, I, I want to say in the early years, starting in about 2012, it was definitely an annual thing. Uh, in more recent Halloween seasons, as life has just gotten uh, crazier, uh, I think it's it's kind of in more of a piecemeal version of the experience. And then, of course, in 2020, it didn't happen at all. Uh, and so this year, w I was just talking with a friend today about, hey, could we do this this year, given the complications of visiting theme parks in the year 2021 park pass reservations, the inability to park hop until 2 PM, et cetera. Uh, and so we were saying, you know, you'd probably have to start with universal first because it doesn't have those restrictions and then head on over to Walt Disney world. Uh, so we'll see if it happens this year. Very interesting. Didn't even think about that. So yes, this is a challenge to anybody listening. I challenge anybody listening to do the same thing and, you know, go to all the attractions we're about to list. We will start with the Disney stuff, of course. And let's start with Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress. Now, of course, I mean, this is... I just love that the holidays are in this attraction in general. And what is the third scene is Halloween. That's right. Yes. The the third decade that we spend time in the 1940s. What I love about uh, having Carousel of Progress on this list is at first glance, I can see how someone would be like, what do you mean Carousel of Progress is a Halloween attraction? But then you remember like, oh, yeah, each scene is, uh, is set in a holiday or in a particular time of year. And there is this one scene that's all about Halloween. And as soon as you enter, there's the jack-o'-lantern on stage. And he's a very 1940s era ceramic jack-o'-lantern, which is just like my favorite favorite type or favorite era of, of household um, Halloween decor. Uh, and then the, the script, the dialogue in this scene really engages with the holiday. Very first thing uh, John Progress says to us is, oh, it's a fabulous Halloween in the 1940s or something like that. And then we have uh, the son. Uh, he's over there with his little werewolf drawing and he's carving a jack-o'-lantern, which he says is inspired by his sister, Patty. Uh, and then, of course, we have Patty getting ready for the night's Halloween party. And so the whole scene really does engage with the holiday. Yeah, I love vintage Halloween decorations. It's like among my favorite things. And I, it seems to have made some sort of comeback. Like I go into a lot of Halloween shops and especially like the paper art you hang on the walls seems to have made a huge comeback. And I just love that stuff. And and I love that the Carousel of Progress uh, features Halloween in one of the scenes. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Next on the list, I mean, this one's pretty obvious why it's on the list, but not specifically Halloween. Let's go to the Haunted Mansion. How could you not, right? Yeah, that's the thing. So as you said, it is not explicitly a Halloween attraction. It doesn't take place on Halloween or anything like that. And yet... No Disney celebration of Halloween is complete without the Haunted Mansion. We see, for uh, example, the the not so great Eddie Murphy Haunted Mansion movie very often turns up on lists of Halloween movies. It's part of uh, Freeform's 13 or 31 Days of Halloween. Uh, we have the Muppets Haunted Mansion movie being released as part of Disney Plus's Halloween season. Uh, when you go to the Boo to You parade at Mickey's Not So Scary, obviously sort of the centerpiece of that parade is an extended Haunted Mansion sequence. Uh, anytime you have a Disney Parks uh, Halloween music playlist, it's always uh, Grim Grinning Ghost is sort of like the central track. And so I think it's, it's really integral to any Halloween experience experience. Plus, it just has the look and feel of, of spooky season. Yeah. And, you know, somebody out here, you mentioned in the Boo to You parade, the Haunted Mansion sequence. And of course, th that 
Halloween party takes place in Magic Kingdom, where the Haunted Mansion is. But out here in California, our Halloween parade is over in Disney California Adventure, yet it still features a Haunted Mansion section of the parade. And I think it was my pal Sam Carter saying on Twitter, it might have been somebody else, but I think it was him. And he made a comment like, Disneyland Resort is so unique because you can have a float in a parade based on an attraction in a different park and it doesn't feel weird. But can you imagine doing that at Walt Disney World? And I thought about it. I'm like, I really can't. And it is kind of unique that that is a thing that can exist at the Disneyland Resort. Yeah. You mean like if you went to Epcot and yeah. there was a Haunted Mansion sequence in the float, parade? It would be like weird, but like it being in DCA... It doesn't, like, honestly, I'd never even thought about it. It doesn't feel weird in the least. I don't know if it's because the parks are so close and it's more like a community, for lack of a better term. I don't know. It's a good point. And I do think proximity is a relevant factor there in terms of the physical location of the parks. But also, I think theme comes into play. Uh, For example, the theme of Epcot or Animal Kingdom is so divergent from Magic Kingdom that it just wouldn't make sense. Whereas... Are you saying DCA doesn't have a strong theme? How dare you? (laughs) I mean, that's part of it. But also, I would say like Hollywood Studios, which does have a strong theme. Somehow, I think it would feel less weird, maybe a little strange, but less jarring to have a Haunted Mansion sequence in a parade in Hollywood Studios versus something like Epcot or Animal Kingdom. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree. If it's going to be done, Disney's Hollywood Studios is the place to do it. I'm not, I mean, you could just argue, hey, there was a Haunted Mansion movie with Eddie Murphy and this is a Hollywood Studios, so it fits. Like, the, you know, the, the way that they do things like that at that point. There park, you go. It's, or you know. to tap into your recent argument, I think it was in Attractions Magazine that we need more movie specific parades at Walt Disney World again. Oh yeah. Disney's Hollywood Studios could have a Muppets Haunted Mansion parade that goes through the Muppets area of Hollywood Studios. That would be perfect. Yeah, I would have loved to see the Muppets added to the Haunted Mansion segments this year, but I mean, you must be excited. Did you you saw that Kermit and Piggy and stuff are going to be part of Disney Marius Nights on Main Street USA, right? Oh, yes, Jeff, I am uh, I am looking at my calendar with a magnifying glass trying to find a way to make this work for me to get out there to see that. Wow, you're that that excited about it, huh? Oh, my gosh, yes. Are you kidding me? I mean, first, <laughs> Christmas is like the one major time of year when I haven't been to Disneyland. So okay. that needs to happen anyway. And then throw the Muppets into the mix. Like, it, that's that's at the top of my list. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of hefty ticket price, but I guess... Yeah. You know, it it does sound like a unique uh, event, so that's kind of cool. But yeah, so the Haunted Mansion, of course, the music, like you said, the visuals, uh, legit, you know, some scares in there as well, which is always fun for the spooky season. And so, of course, that's going to be on the list. Yeah, and it's a haunted house. Let me just say, I mean, we think about Halloween Horror Nights. Like, what is that? It's a collection of haunted houses, a very different type of haunted house. But this is Disney's version of a haunted house, and it's a very classic dark ride haunted house. But yeah, that's a staple of the season. It's perfect. I love it. Next up, an attraction that people might immediately say, oh, yes, of course, because it's a scary attraction. But I don't know if everybody gets the direct connection to Halloween when it comes to the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, where the story actually takes place on Halloween, which I love. But it's not super strong in the attraction. It is in the movie, the TV movie. But... Yeah, I find this interesting. Correct. If, I, if I'm if i remembering correctly, the only explicit reference is just in the opening narration. There's just a reference to it being a Halloween night, right? And then that isn't really revisited again in the attraction. I don't even know. I don't even remember that, to be honest, in the pre-show. What I do remember is like the window of the store. When you exit, there's a jack-o'-lantern in it. That's and right. Yes. There's a bit of Halloween decor there year round. And the story is Halloween 1939. That's uh, right. But I yeah. don't remember if they specifically mention it in the pre-show, to be honest. Yeah. You know, I was thinking they do. We'll have to double check. But uh, yeah, that's a really fun fact and a, a nice little Easter egg for people to keep an eye out for. Our mutual friend Ruben loves to point this out that as you exit the Tower of Terror gift shop, you always want to look back behind you at those windows. And yeah, year round, they are decorated as if it's Halloween. Yeah, so that's awesome. Uh, As I mentioned, the TV movie that starred Steve Gutenberg and Kirsten Dunst in 1997, I believe, uh, was it was much more explicit. In fact, I think the first thing you see written on the screen is it all started on Halloween 1939. So much stronger tie to Halloween in that film. 
for sure. But uh, but yeah, so uh, Twilight Zone Tower Terror, it's got the Halloween specifically, and it's got the scares, which is awesome. Then on your list, you have Phantasmic, and this is Disney Villains, right? Yes, of course. And I seem to recall at least some years that this definitely required some park hopping because, of course, you've got to be back at Hollywood Studios at nighttime for this. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's it's obviously a celebration of Disney villains that in itself makes it sort of Halloween adjacent. Uh, but then there's specifically that Chernabog sequence uh, that's projected on the water. And we see all, you know, sort of all the spirits coming out of the ground and uh, floating through the sky. And that is extremely uh, or very much a part of a Disney Halloween to my mind, because that was featured in so many of those Disney Channel Halloween specials in the 80s and 90s, like a Disney Halloween treat or a Disney Channel Halloween, I think uh, one of them was called. Uh, And so because that was always aired on that channel throughout the season, I get Halloween vibes watching that part of Fantasmic 365. Yeah, I definitely it's funny how many of those clips are related to Halloween for me, like those Disney Halloween treat specials that were on Disney Channel. Those were my introduction to so many things. And actually, one thing I don't think is on your list. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I hope at some point during this day, you go get a treat from the Sleepy Hollow Inn at Magic Kingdom. Oh, for sure. And as I was looking over the list I sent you, Jeff, there were a couple of those like dining or snack locations that I realized really should have been included on the list. So another example is Sweet Spells at Hollywood Studios, which no longer exists, but for so long it did. And part of my pre-Fantasmic ritual was to go over there, get a dessert, like a candy apple or a pretzel or something, and then exit through Villains in Vogue, which was the Villains-themed gift shop there on Sunset Boulevard. Sadly, it no longer exists either. Uh, But yeah, all of that was part of this tradition too. Yeah, well, I mentioned the Sleepy Hollow Inn because the whole you know, Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad introduction for me was definitely part of a Disney Halloween treat or whatever the heck they called the special on the specific year that I watched. Uh, so yeah, I love the Sleepy Hollow and I love that it's there year round in, in um, Liberty Square. Yeah, for sure. Very cool. So, oh, I do want to say before we move on from Fantasmic, I actually just wrote an article for attractions about this as well. How crazy is it how big Disney villains are. People love Disney villains. We have the Fantasmic, a year-round show. We have Disney after-hour events featuring the villains. And we don't get good villains anymore. This is tragic. Yeah, I did read your article. By the way, I love all of your articles in Attractions Magazine. Uh, You're but very uh this, uh, yeah, it's a great point you make. I mean, I do think that there is, uh, there's room for both sort of models of villain, right? Like the classically unabashedly unambiguously evil villain. And then also today's modern, they're misunderstood. They're sort of good at heart with good intentions villain. There's room for both, but I agree with you. It would be a, a shame to let an entire generation or more come and go without ever having a taste of their own classic evil Disney villain the way he, we had with, you know, Ursula and Jafar and Scar and so on. Yeah, I make the argument that the last real villain was Mother Gothel. I'm curious, do you have a different one? Like, who do you think the last solid Disney villain in the classic sense would be? Yeah, I get, I mean, even Mother Gothel, I mean, she's she's certainly not a good person, but I feel that she's given a a sense of, of perspective. You understand where she's coming from, uh, maybe in a way even that we don't quite get with someone like Ursula. Yeah, I, we need more villains. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, the next couple on your list, I'm going to need a little bit of explanation with these. <laughs> the first one, less so, but the sci-fi dine-in what do they call it? The Sci-Fi Dine-In Theater, the Sci-Fi Dine-In Theater Restaurant. I always forget the full name. Yes. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. The Sci-Fi Dine-In. I think you're right. Theater. Uh, yeah. I mean, listen, some of these are are more explicit than others. But for me, this one just has the feel of Halloween, right? You walk in and it's instantly it's nighttime. It's dark. You're at a drive-in theater. The story is like the table you're eating at is like a convertible car. And that is the setting of so many sort of classic B story or B film horror movies uh, where, you know, you're on a date at the drive in theater and there's a monster behind you or a monster comes to attack or something like that. So it's it's a setting that is Halloween adjacent, even if the restaurant, again, doesn't have an explicit Halloween theme. And the movies that you're watching or the clips that you're seeing uh, while dining there 
many of them are sort of like sci-fi slash horror films. So you do get those images of, of screams or attacks or things that are from outer space or growing larger than they're supposed to be. Some body horror, all that sort of stuff works its way into those montages. Yeah, I was curious if there was a specific film that maybe actually featured Halloween or Jack-O-Lantern or something. But no, it's just kind of like more the overall feel of the space. Yeah, that's that's what it is for me. Okay, I man, you're hopping all over Disney's Hollywood Studios as far as timeline is concerned. Unless you, do, I guess maybe you could do dinner there and then dessert at your sweet treats and then Fantasmic. But I mean, this takes some serious organization and planning, which you are the king of. Of <laughs> well, I have to say, I think in my entire life, I've only had one proper meal at Sci-Fi. What we would usually do is we would go in just for milkshakes and sometimes like an appetizer as well. Uh, and so we would usually go in and be like, hey, we just want to come in for milkshakes and snacks. Is that OK? Uh, and if it was not crowded, they say, sure, you can have a convertible on a busier day. They would say, yeah, we just have these smaller tables uh, near the back. If that's OK with you, we'd say, sure. Uh, and so it was usually a much quicker experience. Can I just say I love that restaurant? That is like, it's something we don't have here at Disneyland. And I know it was supposed to be part of Cars Land before it was, you know, Pixar Cars Land. But I love that restaurant. So I'm always amazed at how quiet it is in there, how successfully it creates the mood it's trying to create. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's never been known as the best dining experience in terms of the food itself. Uh, but if you can sort of overlook that, and it's not that it's it's bad, you'll, 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 you'll have a nice enough meal. But the experience, the atmosphere, the imagineering on display is is really excellent and I think often overlooked. I would always choose that over the 50s primetime cafe. I I don't know. I don't like the food there very much. And like you said, sci-fi, it's not like the greatest food, but I've never been like, oh, this is gross. And I believe it may be the first place I ever had the pumpkin pie milkshake many years ago that they don't do anymore. That was the 50s primetime cafe. If you recall, you and I went there. Uh, to get said pumpkin pie. Was that pie my first shake. pumpkin pie? I remember doing the peanut butter and jelly there for the first time, but I feel like sci fi had the pumpkin pie as well. Yeah, you know, it might have been the PB and J that we went for. So maybe you're right about the pumpkin pie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, uh, 50s prime time can stick around simply for the peanut butter and jelly milkshake. <laughs> Although I will say the last time I was there, which was basically a year ago, last October, I wanted a PB&J milkshake and I couldn't get it because like the bar section was still closed mm -hmm. and uh, I wasn't going to go eat a full meal there. So that was a bit of a bummer. So I'm kind of craving one, to be honest. Anywho, let's move on to the next one on the list. Once again, you're going to need to explain this a little bit. Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. I feel like there's a backstory here that I'm not familiar with. Yeah. So it's interesting that you mentioned backstory, because I think that's kind of a, a little bit of a discussion we can get into here. But I think Big Thunder qualifies, in my mind, as a Halloween attraction on a few different counts. Uh, first, very early on in the ride, you encounter a swarm of bats. Uh, as you go through that very first cavern, before, as you're going up your first launch hill, you're sort of attacked by bats in the ride and you hear them all squeaking. And so that's very Halloween-y. Uh, later in the ride, we do ride through a skeleton. It's a giant dinosaur. I think it's specifically a T-Rex skeleton. And the, the car actually kind of goes through its rib cage. Um, so those are two scene or show elements that are Halloween adjacent. Uh, but there is also a backstory wherein the attraction is haunted and that backstory as originally conceived is a little bit problematic. <laughs> and so we've seen Disney modify the backstory over time, but a haunted element has uh, persisted throughout those changes. So in the original backstory, this was a, a mine shaft that was created by white settlers who had gone on to Native American land uh, because it was resource rich uh, and they had set up these mines. Uh, but the Native American population, I guess, incensed by what they viewed as desecration of sacred land by white settlers had cursed the land and the mine train or the, the mines rather so that the trains would sort of come to life and um, move on their own and endanger anyone who would board the trains, uh, which just happened to be us, the guests, which is kind of a it, it's it's a it's a two pronged sort of uh, backstory in terms of its progressivism or lack thereof. Like on the one hand, that backstory acknowledges 
white settlers coming on to Native American land as a taking of land that isn't theirs and as a desecration, to use the wording that I think was used in the original backstory. But on the other hand, it sort of had the effect of um, othering Native Americans and sort of casting them as as these like mysterious spell casting people who are to be mythologized and feared. And, and so that's obviously not a healthy thing. Uh, and so what we saw in recent years was Disney unveil this new backstory uh, with this this gold obsessed mining magnate named Barnabas T. Bullion, whose likeness is based on Tony Baxter. Same idea. He's gone into a mountain to take its resources. But in this new backstory, it's the mountain itself that to defend its own resources uh, sort of curses anyone who comes upon it. And that's why the trains are out of control. That raises the question of, you know, as part of this Halloween exercise, is it fair for us, really Halloween or any other day of the year, is it fair for us to enjoy the haunted nature of Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, given that that haunted element stems from a storyline in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, that is through today's lens problematic? Uh, and and I, I would hope that we can enjoy it through the lens of the modern storyline that thankfully removes that element. Here's the thing. I think that that attraction, as beautiful as it is, just does a terrible job telling a story. You re- you have to study that. You need to look into that to get that story. I don't think anybody is picking up on any of that at all. That's right. It's really not explicitly spelled out anywhere in, in the attraction. There was a lot of uh, literature and promotional material when the attraction opened that spoke to that. There was even a song that spelled out that original backstory. But and I, and I believe it was released at the time. Uh, but yeah, you never hear that song anymore. And then to the extent that the backstory is publicized these days, it is the Tony Baxter slash Barnabas E. Bullion version. It reminds me of what they just did with Jungle Cruise, where they did this huge new backstory for it. And then I go on the thing and I'm like, there's zero mention of this. It's like you once again, you had to do your homework in order to really enjoy any of the effort that went into creating a pretty in-depth story, really. Yeah, but that shift in backstory translated to actual changes to the show scenes in the ride, removing, you know, visually problematic elements. Whereas in Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, because there was never anything explicit about that backstory, they could shift the narrative without having to make any physical changes to the ride. Fair enough. Interesting. All right, so we got Big Thunder Mountain Railroad on the list, followed by the Frontierland shoot an arcade i believe this is just because you see some skeletons and gravestones and stuff in there like spooky visuals right all kinds of spooky visuals yeah uh, and so the the storyline here is sort of tied into it's the town of tumbleweed right which is the same town where big thunder mountain railroads mine shaft is set and so it's an extension of that ride um and so there's all kinds of spooky things happening here too i mean you mentioned there's uh, you know there are ghosts there are hands coming out from the ground there are tombstones there are bats Uh, And so the whole place that you're shooting up is itself haunted. Very cool. And then Pirates of the Caribbean. Of course, talk about ghost stories. We got pirates. That's right. You got pirates, you got ghosts, you got skeletons, uh, and, and you've got a lot of just dark, mysterious caves with spooky music and echoing voices. Uh, and there's just this, this overtone of the supernatural, which have, then, of course, is made much more explicit in the movies and, and the subsequent application of those movies to the ride. But uh, even I don't know about you, Jeff, but I even find just pirates themselves being somehow tangentially Halloweeny, And I don't know if it's because they've just long been uh, part of like the standard costume lineup on Halloween. It's interesting that you should mention that because I've gotten into this conversation with some of the folks over at Midsummer Scream, the Halloween and horror convention that okay. I work for. And, you know, there have been years where like kind of the theme has been Haunted Mansion and stuff like that. And The idea of a Pirates of the Caribbean sort of mega panel or theme has been brought up, and I am diehard like, no, it's not Halloween. Now, I don't say like it doesn't belong on your list. I think what you say, yeah, it has supernatural elements and, of course, tons of skulls and such. I think that it fits a little bit, but to theme an entire Halloween convention around that, I'd be like, nah, I think that that's stretching it personally. Uh, I think the closest thing is you just see kids dress up as pirates a lot for Halloween. 
Yeah, I think that's it. And I would tend to agree with you that an entire Halloween convention themed to pirates would miss the mark a little bit. And if Pirates of the Caribbean were a ride about pirates that did not have all of these elements of the afterlife and spirits and skeletons and all all of that, you know, would it still be on this list? Maybe, but it would be more of a stretch, I think, than it is. Now, interestingly, you just got back home to Orlando from Salem, Massachusetts. And of course, there's tons of witch museums there, but also pirate museums. And of course, we think of witches Halloween. And I've always find it kind of interesting. Of course, the history of Salem, uh, the pirates fit in there. But I don't know that because Salem is so innately Halloween-y, I guess in Salem, the pirates kind of blend into that as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're right. The The reason there's that pirate presence in the town of Salem is because Salem's history just so happens that pirates were an integral part of it, as were alleged witches. And I think you could make an argument that in as much as Salem is like the Halloween capital of our country and our culture, uh, the fact that pirates and witches go hand in hand in Salem lends credence to pirates being a part of Halloween celebration. Yeah, interesting. Now, I'm noticing, not that we finished the list here, but we don't have any representation of Animal Kingdom, do we? Yeah, you know, and I was talking with uh, with our friend Ruben today, trying to remember if we ever went to Animal Kingdom as part of this. And I know that we did because we, we often made it to all six parks. But then the question was, well, what did we do at Animal Kingdom? And I think, and it's not on the list, but I think we went to Dinosaur as part of this because it's just a scary ride. It's not really Halloween-y per se, but if you just think of horror as being a part of Halloween or scares or thrills, I think that's how we brought Animal Kingdom into the fold. I am amazed at the amount of full-grown adults who are legitimately terrified of Dinosaur. I was like, really? Like, so scared. They're like, I will not ride that again. I'm like, really? That is so bizarre to me. Yeah, listen, I was, I can remember when that ride opened, when it was Countdown to Extinction. Of course, I was much younger, but I would not get on it. It was, I was just so terrified by everything that I heard about the ride. It was billed as this really scary attraction. And of course, it was a little more intense then. They toned it down with the conversion to dinosaur. But Jeff, it's pretty scary. That's <laughs> see, even you, it just makes me laugh because like I'm a wuss when it comes to rides. And I just think dinosaur's a blast. Like if you can do Indiana oh, Jones, is. you can do dinosaur. I don't know. I think dinosaur is scarier than Indiana Jones, but I agree they're both a blast. But Indiana Jones is not in pitch dark with giant like man eating <laughs> beasts jumping out at you from nowhere. Unbelievable. All righty, cool. Well, let's head over to Epcot with Living with the Land. I love that this is on the list. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be. So there is a kind of year round Halloween element to this attraction. And then there's also a season specific Halloween element. The year round is that we have those Mickey Mouse gourds, uh, for lack of a better term, Mickey Mouse pumpkins that grow. These are like real pumpkins that are made to grow in the shape of Mickey Mouse. Coolest thing ever. Uh, And that is on display at least much of the year, if not all of the year, inside that greenhouse. And sometimes they will even have those out at the waiting area inside the land pavilion. Um, As you approach the entrance to Soren, they have a little counter where you can sign up for the the behind-the-seeds tour. And sometimes they'll have one of those Mickey-shaped gourds out there to kind of create visual interest to get people over to that counter. Uh, So that's the year round or most of the year element. And then seasonally, there is very often, though I have to say it hasn't happened every year uh, that I can recall, but very often there is some sort of a little Halloween display within the greenhouse. Uh, So they'll have like bales of hay and pumpkins and gourds and then like a scarecrow or two set up as you ride by on your boat. It's the same uh, thing that they do at Christmas time. They'll usually have a snowman, sometimes made of sand, uh, in that same area. So in small ways, this uh, living with the land becomes a, a holiday attraction. It's so funny. As much as I love the scary and horror of Halloween, I am just as much a fan of the farm Halloween, the jack-o'-lanterns and the corn mazes and stuff. Oh my gosh, I love And when the two mix together... It's like heaven for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I did at uh, at Big Thunder Ranch in Disneyland. They used to have that Halloween meal. 
uh, and it was amazing. And they played all Halloween music and they had like um, Halloween, uh, what are those sugar cookies that they would serve in like um, like in a hot griddle? Oh, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Snicker. I think there were Snickerdoodle, right? With the Yeah, they were really good. Yeah. And they had like a Halloween version of that. Oh, it was like it was one of my best memories of a dining experience in Disneyland. And I'm so sad that it's gone now. Yeah, I miss Big Thunder Ranch. I really do. It's really too bad that that's where like Galaxy's Edge had to go. It's sad. Same. But uh, you made me think of when you were talking about that. It's funny. We're going to each other's coasts here. But you made <laughs> me think of Return to Sleepy Hollow. Did you ever get to do that at Fort Wilderness? I didn't get to do the version you're talking about, which is the more recent one uh, where you watch The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And then, spoiler alert, I guess, at the end, there's a surprise visitor. I don't know if we can say who it is. Uh, it's but okay. uh, <laughs> I think it's uh, been yeah. retired at this point, sadly. Well, that's the question, right? I mean, I think but for the pandemic, that would have continued on. It's not happening this year. But the question is, will it come back? I don't well, think Well, and then we 2019, it didn't happen, I think, because of construction over there. That's right. I think I did it its last year, to be honest. I think when I did it was 2018 with my sister. And I really loved it. It's super cool. You're in the barn with the horses watching the event, uh, you know, Ichabod, uh, the, the Headless Horseman's animated short. And then the screen comes up. The fog billows out and there's the Headless Horseman for photos. It was awesome. And it's like one of the most affordable special events ever at a Disney park. It's like $25. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah, I really hope that it does come back. Uh, but what I would love to come back even more than that is what I got to do there, which was the precursor to that experience. And, and the name escapes me, but it used to be many years ago that at Fort Wilderness, you could take a haunted hayride and you and a bunch of other guests would get up on this big giant wagon. You'd sit on actual hay bales and you would have a very sort of spooky, ghostly driver with a lantern take you on a hayride very slowly into the forests of Fort Wilderness. And he would tell you the story in very dramatic fashion of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. And as the story would grow a little spookier and as Ichabod's fear would set in, you know, you got into deeper and darker parts of the woods. And then when you got to the part where Ichabod is being chased, we ourselves, the guests, are chased by none other than the Headless Horseman, who would emerge from the woods, and then our wagon would pick up its pace, and he's chasing us. And Jeff, it was the coolest Halloween experience I have ever had the pleasure of participating in. And it, it lasted for a number of years, up until they started building the Four Seasons Resort back there, near the site of the old um, River Country water park. And because that construction extended into those woods, they had to, I think they at the time said temporarily postpone that attraction uh, and it has never returned. Now that sounds amazing. I love the story of Sleepy Hollow and, you know, old Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts did a theatrical production through their old, I believe it's a 1600s village. And they, it was a similar thing where, well, you walked around this old dark village, like lit by candlelight. And, you know, the horseman came out and galloped you know, through the the bridge and you're in the bridge and stuff. And it's just so cool. Sadly, it's not back this year. I think they moved the production to Texas or something, whoever the producer is. I'm hoping it comes back to Massachusetts sometime soon because it's so cool and it sounds like it set the same sort of mood. I'm curious, was your wagon pulled by horses or was it more of a tractor situation? You know, I think it was pulled by a horse, but it's been so many years now. I, I couldn't tell you for sure. I'll look into it. Interesting. Well, that sounds awesome. And yes, if, if you... I mean, it's a kind of a hidden gem. It's not something that's promoted, at least the one I saw, was not promoted very much. And it's frankly a very small crowd. And it was only a few nights, I think. So yeah. it's something to keep your eye on. That's true of everything over there at Fort Wilderness, which is really a holdover from the old Vacation Kingdom days, right? When Walt Disney World first premiered, it was billed as being so much more than a theme park. And if you look at the early marketing materials, there was really more emphasis on the everything else at the resort, all of the sort of the recreation and the resort uh, activities. It was almost as if Magic Kingdom were an afterthought. And Fort Wilderness to this day is the kind of place where you can go and spend an entire day or multiple days just doing resort activities. And we've just mentioned a few of them here but you're right everything there is a hidden gem and totally worth looking into awesome now next on the list we have grand fiesta tour yeah so this one's cheating a little bit for sure because the holiday 
at play here is really not Halloween, but rather Day of the Dead. And so I hesitate to put it on the list, but the reality is we did always include it as part of this uh, experience. But in doing that, like you want to acknowledge, and certainly we did acknowledge that Day of the Dead and Halloween are not the same holiday. They are not interchangeable, uh, though they do tap into the same themes, right? They both sort of contemplate the afterlife and both of them have origins in celebrating and revering and respecting the dead. And today's modern celebration of Day of the Dead, as I understand it, does it is informed or influenced by, amongst many other traditions, the traditions of Halloween. Uh, and so because it's sort of tapping into some of those same themes, we do include it. It also takes place at the same time of year, right? And there is this scene that, though not explicitly, uh, does certainly appear to be uh, part of the Day of the Dead. And there are skeletons there and there are pinatas there, which invokes candy, which, of course, is itself very Halloween. Uh, and an argument that I have made is that in the most recent version of this ride, the Grand Fiesta Tour starring the Three Caballeros, that one way to read that attraction is that the entire storyline unfolds on the Day of the Dead. Now, again, that's not Imagineering canon, but I think there are visual clues throughout the ride that can kind of lend itself to that reading. Uh, but yeah, so for those reasons, it's always been a part of, of this experience for us. Well, may I have the honor of adding Mickey's Philhar Magic to your list now that Coco is part of it? Absolutely. Of course, you know, it's not yet a part of Mickey's Philhar Magic in Walt Disney World. And I don't think it will be in time for this Halloween. They no, just announced November. the timeline. I think yeah. you're right. It reopens in November. So that's a bummer. Uh, but in the future, yes. However, do you know, and we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but do you know when you could include or how you could include Mickey's Philhar Magic as oh, part of this? Oh, goodness. Well, may, there's the Fantasia sequence, but it's Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yeah, you got to think a little outside the box. It's, it's, it's more the theater, not so much the attraction. Oh god! Is this something that like used to be in that theater? No, it's uh, it's something that happens during Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party. Oh, what's in there during that? I'm not sure. They play just on a loop, uh, the Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Oh, really? Okay, cool. Yeah. Or I should say, it's it's the Ichabod, uh, the Adventures of Ichabod and Mister Toad that they play in there on a loop. Very cool. So you started talking about Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party, and they, of course, sometimes have overlays for some of the attractions that are specifically for Halloween. So, of course, uh, are these available during normal park hours sometimes? No, I I don't know that they ever have been. And it's only been in recent years that we've started to get a lot of these overlays. And so I was trying to recall today, have we ever done this lineup where we hit up all the parks and then end at Mickey's not so scary Halloween party. And I'm just not sure if we've ever combined those in this way. Uh, and so I wish I had better records of like each time that we've done this over the years. Uh, but I still thought that this was, this should be a part of the conversation because for anyone else who's going to try to piece together a marathon of Halloween attractions, if you can include Mickey's not so scary, then you want these to be a part of the lineup because they are very, uh, very like, um, extremely Halloween experiences. So one of them is Pirates of the Caribbean, which during the Halloween party uh, gets a little bit of an added storyline where there are real life pirates, both in the queue and and in the ride. And we've seen over the years, they've enhanced this, they've added more live actors to the experience. And so it just adds a whole other dimension. Uh, Space Mountain, the lights are cut out completely and you get like a hard rock soundtrack instead. And what is so great about this, or in my memory of it, is that when they first announced this Space Mountain overlay, they just said something like there would be special a special lighting package. And so in my mind, I thought, okay, Space Mountain with some strobe lights. I had no idea when I sat down that we were going to be riding in true pitch black darkness and just the surprise of that. Like, you know, we were, we were like 10, 15 seconds into the ride before you fully realize like, Oh, we are going to be riding this in pitch black. And so just the shock of it all combined with the thrill and the music, which was so unexpected that will forever go down as one of my best Disney Halloween memories. That is my dinosaur, by the way, like yeah? that, ter that terrifies me. Your space mountain in general I'm not a fan of it's <laughs> it's too rickety for me and I feel like I'm going to fall out but in the pitch black no I will not do it not going to happen. Oh Jeff so you need to be tricked into it the way that I was. It's not going to happen. You get on not knowing. <laughs> not unless Rick Moranis was like hey you want to ride this with me or Michael Eisner otherwise I'm like nope no thanks. Okay, let's say you absolutely had to choose between either riding Space Mountain in the black in the dark or 
getting on the Skyliner, which would you choose? Ooh, that's a really good question. Do I only have to go one leg of the Skyliner? Yeah, sure. I'd do the Skyliner. Wow, really? Yeah. Wow, I don't like okay. your Space Mountain. I, I, I hate it, in fact. But and you'll do it with a little bit of light, with like the constellation, the starlight. You'll, you'll I'll probably it. never do it again, to be completely honest. Really? Yeah. Wow. I, it just doesn't interest me. Number one, I don't think it's a good ride. I mean, I'm sorry. I know this is a whole argument here, but like Disneyland's, in my mind, there is no discussion when it comes to which Space Mountain is better. Disneyland is a billion percent better. And I know some wow. people don't feel that way. I just like, I can't even see the other side of the argument when it comes to the Space Mountain argument. I I, I think y- yours is crap. I'm sorry. Crap. Wow. Jeff, yeah. such strong words. Uh, listen, I, I don't disagree with you on Disneyland's Space Mountain because I love it. It's amazing. It's awesome. Uh, and very different from ours, certainly. But there's a lot to be said, I think, for the Magic Kingdom experience. First, I think the ricketiness of it is part of the thrill. It's part of the fear, right? Of the ride. But then also, you know, you've seen the movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock, right? Like the fear of space is that you're out there alone. That's the same thing with the movie Alien, like in space, no one can hear you scream. And so the way that the Magic Kingdom's Space Mountain isolates you, right? It makes you ride by yourself in single file lines, so to speak. I think that adds so much to the fear of the attraction and sort of like the the concept of space as as isolating and 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 void of gravity and void of oxygen. Uh, you're just so on your own that <laughs> they should take the oxygen the out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 that's it. That's it. No, I listen. Those are good, valid points. I would just say that number one, when it comes to roller coasters, I am not a thrill roller coaster person. I want, I'm someone who wants to have fun on a roller coaster. So like, Honestly, California Screamin' and Credit Coaster is like the perfect coaster for me. I'm like, oh, there's a little bit of thrill, but it's just fun. Like, there's zero fear when it comes to that coaster for me. I don't ever want to be scared on a coaster. Space Mountain at Disneyland, same thing. I'm like, this is just fun. I don't ever want to be like, oh, this is rickety. That adds to the thrill. I'm not looking for thrill on a coaster. I know some people are. I'm not. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> have you done Ghost Galaxy, though, here at Disneyland? I have. I love Ghost Galaxy. So good. Uh, I wish that we would get it in Magic Kingdom. But that's another great thing about what they do during Not So Scary is that it is sort of like a little taste of Ghost Galaxy. Yeah, the problem is you guys don't have the onboard sound system, right? Well, we have we have music, but it's not... It's not on the ride the vehicle. That right. That's yeah, right. I think that's, that's one of the things I... I mean, that's the biggest preference, I think, when it comes to our Space Mountain is the the way it's choreographed with the music is fantastic every time, whether it's Star Wars or Ghost Galaxy or the original. It's, it's always so good. But in any case, I'm glad you enjoy it. I won't be doing it. Uh, but you get that one. You got Pirates. What else? You have a, a Mad Tea Party overlay, Mad right? Tea Party. It gets its own uh, lighting package, its own uh, music uh, soundtrack with, with like specially scored um, Halloween music, which isn't of the spooky variety. It's more of the like Halloween carnival trick or treating, like fun in the streets kind of uh, vibe. And there's also uh, there are fog effects uh, for that ride during the Halloween party. Uh, Monsters Inc. Laugh Floor uh, gets an overlay. And it's kind of weird the way it works because they keep the entrance and exit doors open at all times and they treat the attraction as a trick or treat trail. So guests can walk through and just pick up candy and leave, or they can sit down and watch a show unfold. And it's a special Halloween trick or treat version of that show. Uh, so you can watch as much of it or as little of it as you want, grab some candy and go. And we've mentioned, of course, uh, Sleepy Hollow playing in Inside Feel Hard Magic. And then the last thing I'll mention at Mickey's Not So Scary, though I don't think it's happened in the past few years, is that in Adventureland and in the Jungle Cruise area, there is a Halloween radio show that plays in lieu of the background music. Uh, so it's sort of like what you hear day to day in the queue of Jungle Cruise but played further out into Adventureland and made specific to Halloween. Very cool. Excellent. So there's that. Now we've got to talk about a few things that are sadly retired, one being the great movie ride. And so let me think. For this, there's the horror movie section, which I always love so much because, uh, number one, I love horror, but I just love it because... You know, the studio down the street, Universal Studios, basically invented the horror movie. And so it was like, okay, we can't really get any classic monsters in this ride. So let's just go generic skeletons. That always makes me laugh. And it's briefly mentioned. That's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's totally the tribute to Universal that can't exist, and so we'll just quickly <laughs> move right on by. Exactly. So there's that. Then there's Alien, which you know I guess you could add into kind of a Halloweeny feel. And then, of course, the Wicked Witch of the West, the Green Witch, is iconic Halloween. Oh, for sure. And she's a key part of it. So, yeah, I mean, in a, what, a third or a quarter of the films that are featured prominently in The Great Movie Ride, you get something sort of Halloween-y there. Uh, And then you get that final film montage, which does itself uh, have a few Halloween moments. You have, for example, Young Frankenstein and the famous, you know, it's either he's alive or it's alive quote from that film. Uh, There's Silence of the Lambs turns up there. Uh, no universal monsters, of course, but we do get those little horror elements. Wait a second. When are those mentioned? Oh, in the montage, you said. In the montage at the end, right. Gotcha, gotcha. Excellent. All right. So that one's retired. And so is Snow White's Scary Adventures, which, of course, terrified people for so many years. For sure. It's right there in the title. Scary Adventures. That's the list of Halloween at the Disney parks. Let's briefly touch on the Universal Parks, because, as you mentioned, that's a part of your little adventure as well. Speaking of adventures, let's go to the E.T. adventure, which if you really think about it, and I honestly hadn't before doing that Halloween podcast last year, which is crazy because E.T. is one of my favorite films of all time. It is totally a Halloween movie. It takes place a few days before Halloween, on Halloween, and a day or two after. It's crazy how Halloween it is. Yeah, it's so funny you mentioned that because like you, I grew up loving E.T., had seen it a bunch of times, and also grew up loving Halloween my whole life. And then one day, I think I was in college maybe, and and someone mentioned to me that E.T. was a Halloween movie. And I was like, what? So I went back and rewatched it. And it's like, how did I never focus on this before? Because Halloween isn't just incidental. It's not just mentioned sort of offhand. Like, it's integral to the story. And the whole plot unfolds on Halloween with Halloween as part of the story. Um, So that makes... E.T., I think, what, the second attraction on this list to actually take place, the E.T. adventure, rather, to actually take place on Halloween. Yeah, I love that. You have Revenge of the Mummy, of course, Mummy's Halloween. We're going into classic Universal Monsters territory, right? That's exactly right. And it's because the Universal Monsters are not only one of their classic properties, but also uh, so focal at uh, Universal Studios Florida uh, that that you do want to make that park, if you can, part of this lineup. Uh, And yeah, the Revenge of the Mummy, not only is there the mummy, uh, but it's also a legitimately scary ride, not only in terms of the thrills, but I mean, there are like jump scares in that ride. You know, uh, this is becoming the Attractions Magazine plug show because I'm going to mention another article I wrote for them, which is I really genuinely 100% believe that Halloween Horror Nights should be themed entirely to the Universal Monster some year. I think it's crazy that they haven't. They wouldn't have to pay any licensing rights, and I think it would do extraordinarily well. I'd be all for it. I mean, the 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 Universal Monsters haunted house is always one of the best parts of Horror Nights for my money. They're always so good. I love it. I don't know why they haven't done it yet. We've got the Universal's Horror Makeup Show, which is a fun show uh, showing the horror makeup, which is always a lot of fun year-round there. Then there's the Monsters Cafe, which honestly, I don't know if I've ever eaten at, but I always see the statues on top and enjoy them. Oh, Jeff, you would love it. And you just mentioned my trip to Salem. I don't know if you're familiar with Count Orlock's um, Halloween Museum or Monster Museum there. But uh, as we toured it, which is just this museum of replicas of classic monsters and, and characters from horror films, we remarked that it felt very much like the Monsters Cafe at Universal, which is a restaurant, but really feels like a museum. And you eat in these highly themed environments. And yeah, it's just extremely Halloween-y. Yeah, I've walked through it, and I really do enjoy the decor and the look of it. It's very cool. I'm glad that it's still there, because it is one of those things that, I mean, there is so little, including the E.T. adventure, but there is so little from, like, OG Universal Studios Florida that still exists that when there is, and I don't know how far back, honestly, Monsters Cafe goes. Do you know if that's an opening year thing? I don't know either. I wouldn't be surprised if it is, but I'm not sure. Then you have Diagon Alley, really all of Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Um... I know there's the the dark area of Diagon Alley, but why all of Wizarding World in general? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think all of Harry Potter to me feels uh, Halloween adjacent again because it is all about witches, wizards, uh, magic, spells being cast, um, danger in the dark. Ghosts are a part of sort of the whole lore of Hogwarts, right? Uh, And so 
you've got the song Something Wicked This Way Comes, which you hear being performed inside the theme park sometimes. And then just walking through Wizarding World, you see, you know, pumpkin juice is being served and pumpkin pasties and cauldron cakes and you see cauldrons in the decor and you see witches on the signs and you see people in their cloaks and their robes and the pointy hats and so there's just the feel the look the aesthetic of halloween and then of course certainly you take that turn down nocturne alley uh where it does certain suddenly feel very dangerous and ominous uh in a way that again lends itself to halloween all righty then we've got Skull Island, Reign of Kong. I mean, the word skull is right in the title, so it's kind of a given. Yeah, the word skull is in the title. You've got Kong, who, though not officially a universal monster, is sometimes treated as part of that group. Uh, and then fundamentally, I mean, the the cue to that attraction is essentially a haunted house, uh, at least on days when they're operating it that way, right? Like you yeah. do have scare actors who are jumping out at you as you move through that queue. And there's a lot of scary music playing. And there's sort of a very decrepit, very horrifying animatronic as you move through the queue. So again, a very scary experience. And then over in the Springfield area of Universal Studios, Florida, we have Kang and Kodo's Twirl and Hurl. And of course, these characters were first seen in one of the Treehouse of Horror episodes episodes of The Simpsons, right? That's right. And in fact, they're seen in every Treehouse of Horror episode. And I think they might have made, I'm not a Simpsons expert. I think they might have made some appearances outside of that uh, saga. But for the most part, they are known as sort of the icons of the Treehouse of Horror uh, series. And so what I like about this being on the list is it's another one of those attractions where at first glance, you might say, wait a minute, how is this Halloween? But when you know that Simpsons history, you think, oh, this is very much a Halloween attraction because these are Halloween characters. I also wrote an article about how Universal missed the mark never doing a Treehouse of Horror maze of some sort, and now they probably never will now that Disney owns them. But come on. Oh my gosh. They missed out on that. It's too bad. Yeah. Crazy. Oh, that would have been amazing. And then finally on the list is Men in Black Alien Attack. Yeah. No, this one's a little bit of a stretch because, you know, I wouldn't say that, like aliens are inherently Halloween y, but I think something about the way they're presented in this attraction, again, it's dark. They are bright and colorful and they pop out at you in a way that, again, is sort of like a jump scare. Not that it's really a scary attraction, but just those elements give it sort of a Halloween vibe for me. Excellent. Well, I love this list. I love that you have this tradition. This is awesome. Is there anything you want to add before we jump into some trivia? No, I would just say if anyone ever has the opportunity to do this, and I think the key is to do only attractions that relate to Halloween for the day at the end of the day, you've done a bunch of stuff that you're familiar with, but you feel that you've, you've seen everything in a new light. Uh, and it just gives you like a new perspective, a new way to enjoy these attractions. And it feels extremely festive and celebratory. Uh, and so I just can't recommend it enough. And I would suggest that you make a playlist to listen to as you go from one attraction to the next and all of you and your friends should have in your airpods or whatever and be listening to the same playlist full of halloweeny music to further enhance the theme oh my gosh jeff as someone who has received many of my unsolicited playlists over the years you know that no one has to ask me to make a playlist twice so i will absolutely (laughs) be doing that excellent well this has been a lot of fun thanks for the conversation but now let's get to some trivia know the answer get your brain gears churning and play along it's trivia time all righty aaron do you want to hit with the trivia question first or shall i hit you okay i'll I'll ask you first in 2014 mickey's not so scary halloween party added a specially ticketed character dining experience inside the cinderella's royal table restaurant entitled villains sinister soiree a wicked takeover of Cinderella Castle. The question is, which characters were regularly featured as part of that experience? Well, I would have to assume the wicked stepmother, right? Cinderella's stepmother. Yes, and in fact, she was kind of the hosting villain. Okay. How many other villains were there? Eight others. Eight? Jeez. Let's say you can just give me five out of the eight. Let's go with some classics here. Maleficent. Yep. Cruella de Vil. I'm going to say Queen of Hearts. Uh, You know what? Yes, she was not on the list I pulled up, but I know for a fact I saw a video of her there. So I'm going to give that to you. Okay. um, Evil Queen. Yes. Gosh, that's a lot of villains. Uh, For some, this is probably totally wrong, but who are the little sidekicks in Hercules? Oh, Pain and Panic. I can totally picture them there. Oh, I wish. I wish they would have been, but no. 
But you're already at your five, by the way. But you can keep guessing. Let me see. Who else? Uh, Gaston. No, I don't think so. So I did see a passing reference to him having been there in articles. So maybe he was there like one night, but he was not part of the regular lineup. Okay. Who was the regular lineup then? Okay. So the other ones you haven't gotten. Judge Claude Frollo. Very uh, nice. Drizella. Anastasia. Did you say Corella Deville? I said Corella. Yeah. yeah okay. And then Dr. Facilier. Oh, nice. That's a solid mix of villains yeah. right there. And can I give you a fun follow-up question that relates to the same event? Please do. Okay. So during that uh, dinner, Lady Tremaine, Anastasia, and Drizella performed a cabaret-style mashup of Sing Sweet Nightingale, which is a song from Cinderella, and which thematically appropriate pop song? Sing Sweet Nightingale and, oh gosh, I don't know pop music well enough. Oh, in 2014? 2014 was the year this happened. So the song came from 2013, if that helps. It doesn't and, help and at all. Thematically appropriate. Sing Sweet Nightingale. Do you say like related to Sing Sweet Nightingale or more related to like the space it's in? More related to who's singing it. The stepsisters are singing And Lady it. Tremaine. Lady Tremaine. Oh, I don't know. What? Okay. So it's the song Royals by Lord. And the uh, chorus, of course, is... And will never be royals. Dude, that's pretty genius, whoever thought of that. Yeah. Yeah, like so random, but so clever. Very clever. I appreciate that. Well, my question for you is not nearly as good as the one that you had, but I want to know what year were the holidays added to Carousel of Progress? Now, I believe there's always been the finale Christmas or New Year's, but when was a holiday added to every scene in that attraction? Yeah, so I do actually know this one. So the the original version of the attraction, you're right, ended with Christmas, but that was the only holiday there. Then when they updated it in the 70s and again in the 80s, they changed the finale to New Year's. So that was the only holiday there. But then it was in, I believe, 1994 with the uh, conversion to Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress that they changed the finale back to Christmas and then also brought in the three additional holidays, which were Valentine's, Fourth of July and Halloween. So the exact year is actually 1993, so you're off by one year, but close enough, and you're right, you got all the holidays, and you got, gave me all that added info, so I'll just say you're right. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> close enough. Excellent. Well, Aaron, this was a lot of fun. Thanks so much for coming on. I am excited to see that there is actually a new episode recently in your podcast feed, so why don't you tell folks about that before we get going? That's right. So my podcast on Main Street with Aaron Wallace, which has been running for many years, albeit originally under a different name, uh, has always had sort of a sporadic release schedule. It is back recently with a new episode all about the movie Mary Poppins Returns. It's a deep dive into that movie, uh, it, its characters, its songs, uh, sort of all the details, why we love it, what works, what doesn't. Uh, so I invite everyone to find it on your podcast app or come to my website, AaronWallaceOnline.com, uh, where you can learn about the that and all my other projects. And since we just finished talking about Halloween, I'll highlight one of those, which is my book, Hocus Pocus in Focus, which uh, is a deep dive into the making and the meaning of that beloved 1993 Halloween classic. And I say with all the sincerest uh, notions in the world, it is a fantastic read. It makes the movie better. Boom. I said it. It makes the movie better having read that book which is a hard thing to do. So that's very sweet. And that's going to replace your current pull quote on the book for the next edition. <laughs> All right, there we go. Well, folks, thanks for tuning in. Aaron, thanks for coming on. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks, Jeff. I hope you all enjoyed today's conversation. On the last couple of episodes, we talked about Walt Disney World's 50th anniversary, as well as some updated info for the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser. On next week's episode, we'll be back with some Disney news, followed by an episode all about the new Halloween special, Muppets Haunted Mansion. And if you're a Halloween fan, don't forget that That Halloween Podcast is releasing new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday this month. That's That Halloween Podcast, and you can find it in the same places where you find Disney Coast to Coast. The easiest way to make sure you don't miss any of the magic is by subscribing to Disney Coast to Coast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 
Wherever you search, don't forget, it's Disney with a Z, coast to coast. You can find any links and info mentioned in this episode, along with ways to connect with today's guest co-host, by checking out the show note link in this episode's description. This episode has been executive produced by Robert Scontrino. Gain rewards like Robert by visiting patreon.com slash Disney, with a Z, CTC. And don't forget to leave a voicemail at 818-860-2569 to share your thoughts on today's conversation and the chance to be heard on a future episode. You can find that number in this episode's description, along with a link for some free gifts from me to you. Other than that, folks, have a magical day. Bye! Thanks for listening to Disney Coast to Coast! Have a magical day! <laughs> Disney Coast to Coast is produced and hosted by Jeff DePauly. Learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. This podcast is part of the DePodcast Network. Learn more about this show, plus find more quality and entertaining podcasts at DePodcastNetwork.com. That's D-E-PodcastNetwork.com.